looks even worse. But anyway, okay. <laughs> you're, you're doing good. You look great. You look great. Um, so it's recording, but it's not on Facebook Live yet. So I'll tell you when we're on live and, and it'll be a note. So, um, and uh, we're still recording, but, and sometimes um, we have trouble with the live. And so we'll just record and I'll just put that over in case. And uh, Melissa will talk to me in the chat. And there might be some questions from Facebook Live or whatever. So let's see. Um, so it, it's like 100 degrees over here. What's it like in, in Eastern Fargo? We're still not live. OK. Um, it's not I mean, like literally 100 degrees. Um, I'd say it's about um, 80. Oh, that's nice. I thought it was, I, I think it's rather pleasant out there. Oh, wow. So it must be just out here. <laughs> okay. We I had a, actually had a rain, a thunderstorm go through this morning. Okay. So. Wow. Okay. Melissa said it's loading. It's just slow. Okay. So does that mean we're live, Melissa, or no? Not yet. Okay. So we'll wait a little bit. Yeah, it's 80 degrees. Supposed to get up to okay. 91. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this, what this is about is just kind of like interesting people in North Dakota. A lot of people don't know North Dakotans. And that's what I'll explain at first. And, uh, and then, you know, you'll be, um, you'll be introduced and we'll just start getting to know you. So, yeah. I'm actually heading out your way this uh, this weekend. Uh, so I'll, actually, after this homegrown stories, I'll be heading out to Fargo for some meetings and for the DNC thing and and stuff like that. Have so. you been watching the convention? A little bit here and there. I go. I'm pretty busy right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so what I try to do is watch the highlights. You know, the yeah. next day. Yeah. Um, you know, I have some sweethearts that I love, like Michelle and 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 stuff like that. But. Yeah, and so, um, but we're doing that drive-in movie thing uh, out in the Fargo area on Thursday. Oh, ah, yeah. okay, okay yeah. cool. Yeah, and I'll be introducing Governor Whitmore at tomorrow's breakfast, too. I don't know exactly what we're doing. Um, oh. So tomorrow's breakfast, I think she's, I, I don't know. Oh, okay. cool. I, okay. I, love, I love the roll call. Well, yeah. I love the thought of it. I missed it. I, I, so what am I saying? Um, but it, it sounded like a really great, the way it came off was really good. Okay. <laughs> so Melissa said, we're just going to give her 30 more seconds. I think it's the Facebook is not cooperating. That's what happens sometimes. So sometimes it's not live, but then it'll be okay. Now we're live. Okay. So Welcome everybody to Homegrown Stories. Uh, this is the, the moment that, the, that I do to help everybody understand how diverse and wonderful North Dakotans are. So uh, around the state and so the whole world that's watching. So today I have Barry Nelson. Barry, welcome to Homegrown Stories. Thank you. Glad oh. to be here, Dr. Shelley. Yeah, you bet. Okay, so Let's just get right on into it. Um, Barry, tell us first of all where you grew up. I grew up on a, a small dairy mixed egg farm um, outside of the small town of Catherine, North Dakota, which is south of Valley City. We always claim that it was more beautiful than productive, um, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a wonderful place to uh, grow up in the hills of the Cheyenne River Valley. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. And so, and you grew up like brothers and sisters. Tell us about your, like, where did your parents come from? Like, how, what? I grew up on the farm that my dad grew up on. Um, so it was the third generation. In fact, in 2016, we celebrated 100 years of Nelson ownership of the uh, oh. farm. Uh -huh. And so that was where my, other than when he served in World War II, my dad pretty much had spent all his time on that farm until he and my mom had gone, went to assisted living about 10 years ago. So that was very, very bitter, bittersweet. Um, my mother was right down the road. Um, she's from the small town of Fort Ransom. 
um, which there was, it was an interesting, um, both communities were very uh, Norwegian immigrant rich, um, mm -hmm. except the, the, the Norwegians and Catherine talked about that the Norwegians in Fort Ransom spoke pig Norwegian. So there's a little rivalry going on. Okay. Um, and uh, they, they, unlike their generation, married later in life. And then they had, um, I was the oldest born, and then they had three more after me, three girls. Okay. And yeah, so I would say that my, my Norwegian heritage, my grandparents were immigrants from Norway. Okay spoke Norwegian in the home. All right. uh, my parents spoke Norwegian in the home and they didn't want us to know what they were talking about. Yeah. So we spent most of our growing up time saying, speak English, speak English. <laughs> and, um, but it was, the, the culture was very uh, an integrated part of um, our life. Okay, okay. And so what's your favorite uh, dish that your mom makes, Norwegian dish? Oh gosh, you know, there are really, many of them and she was a really good cook she always diminished her cooking um but she let's see you know probably the the ringa kaka and the krum kaka were probably they were both baked goods that were just they were holiday favorites and so i would okay. call them comfort food yeah very good very good very good okay so you were you were raised on the the farm and then um so then what happened? You, uh, did you go to school or were you, what, what, tell us about your education and your career then after. So you know. I graduated in a class of 11 from Catherine High School. Okay. And um, so, and, and I'd always brag to my kids, I was, I was valedictorian of a class of 11. <laughs> um, went to North Dakota State University. Um, and it wasn't necessarily uh, my, my, goal was really to do social work so the, my decision to go to NDSU was really not the most great trajectory career-wise I, I majored in sociology psychology with a minor in music um, but it just seemed it seemed closer to home than UND which had the uh, social work program Okay. And so that was my, that was my, I went there uh, 1970, graduated in 1974, mm -hmm. uh, began working right away in social services at uh, Grafton, um, Walsh County Social Services. Okay. Um, and periodically I would go back to make a stab at getting a, a, a graduate degree and life kept getting busy so I would never complete them. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll get to your social uh, work degree in just a second. But you, well, music that I didn't know that about you. So where did that come from? Was was it a musical family or? or... Yeah, I I um, my mother had was a was a piano player, and okay. a lot of standing around the piano singing. My sister and I went on the road performing at weddings and golden anniversaries. So. Oh. We sang until my voice broke, <laughs> um, but I was very active in choir and band in high school and uh, got to college, tried out for the choir there. I was told I had potential. So I, I think it was just because I, it, it, there was no career goal with that. It was something that I just enjoyed doing. Okay, okay, I like that, I like that. So, um... I wonder, too bad we don't have some uh, videos from that time. <laughs> that would be fun. <laughs> okay, so why, you, you went into sociology, so you knew from the get-go. Um, well, let's tell everybody what you do now, what's your career now, and, uh, and then I'll ask you from that, so, yeah. Sure. So I am, I am of retirement age, but retirement doesn't sound particularly interesting to me. So I have continued working with the North Dakota Human Rights Coalition um, as a contracted organizer. Um, I've been around that organization since in its inception in 2002, um, okay. mostly as board members along the way, as a board member along the way. And then I, last time I termed out, um, we had actually raised enough money that they felt they could maybe pay somebody to do some of the work. So um, I've been doing that now for the past three years. And then I'm also on the Fargo Human Relations Commission. 
which has as its root um, also um, to work against discrimination and promote um, diversity in our community. So they very, very much are synchronized. Right. So you went from, you went right away from to, into sociology. So what in your, in your past, in your upbringing, how did you like develop this um, commitment to others and, and to the, your field? I mean, is it, is it the way you're raised or the, how did that happen? Cause you're, cause for somebody that young to stay in the, in the career that they were going to be in for till retirement age is amazing. <laughs> I, and you know, and I do, I, I get, I get defensive because sometimes people char characterize North Dakotans in certain ways and I say, well, but I'm a North Dakotan and I don't believe the way that you're characterizing North Dakotans believe when it comes to social causes and progressiveness right. and those kinds of things. Right. And I, I, you know, I do attribute it to my mother. My mother was always that person that was looking out for somebody that's, that didn't have a place to go or didn't have a table to sit at or a meal. Um, we always had people in our home um, sharing food. Okay. Um, so I have to believe that that's, that's where it was really, um, um, it, where it started out as. Um, I also, I went into social work, or, social work as a, a compromise. My grandfather always told me that I was going to be a pastor. Oh. And okay. uh, my reaction to that was, I don't want to be a pastor. So what's the next best thing? Pastors do good, right? So right. maybe if I could do something good where I don't have to preach and be quite as on top of my game all the time. So it was kind <laughs> of a um, And I, I think that it was, um, it, it just seemed, I don't think that I was really aware of social issues. I mean, I did, I did this charity kind of social work when I first yeah. started out which okay. is helping people who are in, in need. Um, and then along the way, I started realizing that there was systems in place that really were causing problems for people. It wasn't just bad decisions or um, lack of money or, or upbringing. It was, we had some real systemic issues. Okay. And that was really introduced to me when I started working with refugees arriving into our country and in our state. Um, and I, I always, it's, I remember that realization at one point where I thought, wow, people have left horrific, horrific backgrounds. They, they have escaped and now they're in the United States. Now they're in North Dakota and their life will be good going forward. Amen. Yeah. And then I started finding out that, no, we have a lot of things. There are some wonderful, wonderful people that are interacting and are being very helpful, but we have some real ingrained kinds of systemic things that are making their life as difficult here as it was perhaps where they came from. And that's yeah. what changed my attention to the, um, the macro sense of what's going on. So what decade was that? Cause well, I want, I want to go back and I agree with you. I mean, I think North Dakotans, you know, have like, as far as I know, I mean, hear about like, you know, how we, how well we treated the prisoners of war in, in World War II and, and, and uh, the Vietnamese that came with the Lutheran uh, services. And th that's what I know. And uh, in general, North Dakotans are just such good people. So when was that decade that you had that um, epiphany? And I'd like to know how the decades have changed as you've been so attuned to it, you know, over the decades. Sure. I would say it would have been the 1980s. That was my awakening. Okay. Um, that's when I started working um, with, with um, people. I, I be began actually as a sponsor of a Cambodian family um, okay. in late, the late 70s through my church. Um, and that, <laughs> that is something that's evolved uh, to this day. We are, we are very close personal friends with the people that we, we originally were there sponsor um yeah. now we're now we're now we're friends um and um and that really opened th th there was these doors that just kept opening from that i went to starting to work for lutheran social services uh within on the company minor program which was working with children who came without parents and then that evolved into working with the overall resettlement program and it was it was a very um incredibly um 
rich time. And I just, I, I remember the, the specific issue that made me realize that we, we have problems here. Um, and that was that, that when people came, they were expected to work. Mm -hmm. And if you live in North Dakota and work in North Dakota, you have to drive in North Dakota. Right. And all of the, almost everybody that we resettled had driven vehicles in their country of origin, but they had to take um, the uh, driver's test in North Dakota um, written. And we were told the, the driver's license test was written at about a sixth grade reading level. Okay. And I discovered that most adults learning a second language, it takes about 10 years to achieve that. Oh, yeah. So it just was not working. They were, they, were, they were being unable to commute or get to work and so forth. So the simple was, thing was, we looked at other states that said, you don't have to speak English to know how to drive. Right. So that what, they, what other states had done is they, they translated the driver's test into the languages of people coming. And there was just systemic opposition to that. Oh, totally. really? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that's what. So that was the part that was surprising to you, because that's surprising to me. Yeah, because it made perfect sense to me that mm -hmm. other states are doing it. Um, there's no reason not to do it. Um, but we were hearing all these reasons that you know, if you let these people drive, we're going to have accidents. They're going to be running off the road. They're going to be killing people. Um, they're, they'll be dangerous. And um, the information that we were bringing from other states didn't seem to make any difference. Yeah. So we thought there were some other underlying reasons why this law initially wasn't going to be uh, uh, passed. It originally, or in, in the end, it was. Right. But in North Dakota style, even sensical laws take three to four years to right. accomplish. Right. So, uh, well, two things. One, I'm not sure if this is true, but I think United States is the one country where we actually don't even have an official language. Like so many countries have official language, we don't actually have an official language. So that's what interesting. And I don't know if that's true, but that's what I thought. Um, but so when you realize this, how did you go about making it happen then? I mean, obviously persistence, but like what, what like as our, our fellow North Dakotans start realizing some of these things that we just are surprising to us because we're such good, friendly people, like, how did you start making that happen? We thought it was going to be simple at first. We just went to the Division of Motor Vehicle and said, you know, could you start doing this? And they said no. So then it was like, well, um, we would go do it legislatively. So we contacted legislators. Okay. Um, to this day, I, I have an extreme amount of respect um, because uh, Senator Oban of Bismarck, took this on as his cause. And um, he worked it and worked it and worked it until, I mean, there was hearings after hearings after hearings where people needed to come to these committees and, and testify as to why it was. And um, like I said, eventually it was, it made enough sense that it, the, the law was passed. So it took, it took organizing, yeah. it, took in, it took having a, a, a message and a theme, and it took some really great champions within the, the, the North Dakota legislature. Okay, great. That's good. Uh, it, well, it's good and it's bad. It's good that, you know, you had uh, supporters and champions and all the energy. So what percentage, as you're moving through, like, as you're discovering some systematic problems, uh, what percentage actually have to go that whole legislative route versus just not doing that? Like just changing hearts and minds. I mean, what you have to do through the legislature, but you know what I, you know, how, yeah. how persuadable yeah. are North Dakotans, I guess, is what I'm asking. In well, your experience. I always said that my, my career allowed me to be amongst the best North Dakota had to offer. Yeah. And I include in that the people who would rise up to, to want to help interact, be friends, support uh, people who are coming in from all over the world. And it included those people who did come in from all over the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there's a vetting process for fine upstanding people, but my goodness, the people that I met coming in our country, through our doors, whether it was from Vietnam or Bulgaria or Romania or the former Soviet Union or the Sudan, it was just some extraordinary people. 
that I continue to count in, in my memory banks as really, really, really important and who are now I see stepping into leadership roles um, in yeah. their, their new country. It's just, it's just really incredible. Yeah. So I think from a, from a basic um, assisting people stance, that, that was always there. Mm -hmm. people, whether people would, and there were key people who would uh, step up um, in the school systems because obviously children were coming into school right. um, with, with, did not have the basic language needs they needed in, in initially. Yeah. Um, and they needed, some of them, you know, were coming into our school system at age 12, 15. Um, so there were some real challenges in how to maneuver and help children achieve their potential there. So there were some really key people there. There was um, key people in our healthcare system. Gosh, there's some champions there that, that come to yeah. mind as they just really recognize the importance of, of good health and good supported health and culturally appropriate health. Um, so those are, the, those are the things that just kind of happen um, on their own. Um, I also experienced along the way, and I think we, we see this surfacing periodically, that there was a lot, there were a, a number of people in our state and in our systems who truly did not believe, who, who probably believed that immigration should have ended when their ancestors came and just really felt that there was, there was just not a reason to do this and that it was too much impact on our society. I think there was fear embedded in that because these weren't people immigrating from Norway or Germany. These yeah. were people coming from other parts of the world. They look, look different. Maybe some of them had different religion backgrounds. Yeah. So periodically there's been attempts to, to limit, um, to cast um, fear. Um, as recent as two sessions ago, there was a bill introduced that would allow cities to shut their doors to refugees. Oh. Um, and the, oh. the whole basis of that law was, okay. was chilling. It was, it was just very much a, a going against the grain, I believe, of our, of our state. And it did not pass. So I, I give credit for the sensibilities of, of legislators, but yeah. we have to be vigilant. We know, we yeah. know that this isn't a given. That's true, 100%. And it's always just shocking to me just because we have, I mean, it's, so that's why it's good to hear this. So has it gotten a little more open over the decades for you? Or is it like, do you see it kind of that, that opening and closing and like, you know, fear, you know, depending on the. Yeah, I think as a rule, if you were looking at the trajectory, my, my favorite saying is the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Yeah. And so maybe that holds true in, in how um, we as a state have adapted to this change. Um, it it kind of surprised me, again, being a, a child of immigrants. I mean, that was an everyday experience where I, I knew what yeah. I would hear stories of the old country and people making the choice to come here. Yeah. Um, so to me, it felt like we're not that far removed from our immigrant roots, that there would just be this natural understanding of right. people coming here. Um, but I think, like I said before, I think it was this, we've somewhat, sometimes been called a very insular part of the country. We may not have been impacted by the, the changes that other parts of the country had in, been impacted beforehand. Um, but I do think, I think that particularly um, the eastern part of the state, um, Fargo, Grand Forks, um, to a lesser degree, Bismarck, where most of the refugees ultimately settled, um, have, have recognized the value and mm -hmm. I think the systems have become more accommodating, both through, because of, through language yeah. and cultural accommodations. Um, and, and then I think they recognize that, oh my gosh, we're getting all these wonderful restaurants of flavors from all over the world that we can just choose on a weekend yeah. when the pandemic isn't happening. Um, but yeah. <laughs> that would be um, uh, really um, um, incredible asset to um, the community. So I would say that uh, from that perspective, it has, um, we're in a better position now than we were back in the 1980s. Good, 
That is good news. And I, I just want to kind of, um, you know, you, you mentioned the urban centers, which are often a little more progressive, but my experience, and you can tell me if this is true or not in your experience, but immigrants are actually quite conservative in, in the true sense of the word of conservative. And um, so do you find that they're settling more in those urban areas just because it's a little more progressive and the jobs are there? Or is it, um, you know, so why the urban areas and like where I see immigrants as being very culturally conservative, whether, you know, religious, family values, you know, um, safety, com com community commitment. I mean, those are conservative values. So yeah. that's why I'm a, a little surprised at that, but maybe it's jobs or something, housing. Well, I think jobs would be number one. I, oh. I really do think that that, that is where, um, where people gravitate, is that they, they know that there's a place they can go to support their family. Um, but I think it's, and this is the immigrant story. I, I think of where my grandparents settled in in Fort Ransom, where when, when my grandparents got together and we kids were there, everybody in that room spoke Norwegian. Yeah. And I mean, they, they had, they, they were truly, they, they were proud of being Americans. They had moved and embraced their American nationality um, um, with, with um, full um, emotion. Um, you know, they vote, voted whenever they could, were able to do so. Uh, made sure that their children were raised in the means of their their new country, but but they truly felt at at home and comfort when right. they were amongst other people from. And Fort Ransom was not even just from Norway; it had to be from this region of Norway that they could come and share stories. And right. I, and that's the immigrant story today. That that um, back in when I was first beginning working with refugee resettlement. Refugees, in fact, were resettled throughout the state. Wherever there would be a church, my hometown of Catherine sponsored several Vietnamese families. And, and the families were grateful for the support they received from the community, but they were desperately lonely. Yeah. And so yeah. whenever they had the opportunity, they, they yeah. would move to an area where they had other people from their country. Um, yeah. I think particularly in the first generation, yeah, uh, that changes uh, later on. And that's sometimes, you know, that feels very threatening to those of us who've been here for a long time, you know, with the idea that they're not speaking English. And um, the first generation um, probably won't, but that, that's transitory and it's going to yeah. change yeah. rapidly. Yeah. I think that's a good point, and that might that explains a lot. I, I know when I go to foreign countries, and even if I half speak the language, there's not that subtle the sense of humor, the the you know the the just these subtle things that you know that you're at home when you're speaking your own language from your own culture. So, I I would even say that generationally, like I like my employees are like 30 years younger than me, and I don't think they think I'm funny. <laughs> and they know that, like, and I think I am. So I just, I love that, that, you know, and I really like that you're right in between of your, your, you're that generation that, that transitioned and you're helping bring that understanding to our immigrant families, as well as our fellow North Dakotans that are right in that um, area too. So, so thank you for doing all that. And I'm glad you were raised in North Dakota and have all those values. Um, but now, I mean, this is a problem, I mean, uh, sociology or uh, human rights, like you said, we always have to be vigilant and move forward, that move that arc, that, uh, so it always points towards justice and humanity. Uh, so, but there's a new generation coming up. So what, how are you going to pass that torch and what kind of advice might you give to people that want to be you basically because it's just so beautiful and meaningful and purposeful and it and it go and it and it like you were saying it transcends generations like the family that lived with you is now your your friends and i'm sure they're like grandkids to you now their kids so what kind of advice can you can you give to the new generation of north dakotans that are going to be pulling up that torch oh that's really that's really an an, an important a very important 
question. Um, I, in some ways, I'm I am so gratified to see um, members of the the, the our, our newest generation. Uh, my grandkids are becoming the part of that generation, or the ones that are moving up into um, um, and through their education and, and moving into leadership roles in their community. Um, I, I think number one would be to be extremely um, uh, aware of your own sense of of justice in the world. Um, I think that if one is not driven by a sense of justice, this would be extremely hard and non-gratifying uh, work. Um, it, it at times feels as though we're going two steps forward, three steps back, um, and so um, we need to be really tuned in to what it is that's motivating us in this in this work um, and it's easier done if you can um, attribute this to individuals around you so one is be really open to people that are are maybe not the same as you around you find out their stories learn about yeah. them the, the the more different they are than you um, the better the the story that will enrich your own sense of the world yeah um, I think secondly would be to um, is to surround yourself with with like minded people because I think that this is this could be really again lonely work if one felt like it was the weight of this issue was on your shoulders and you um, were surrounded with people who really questioned what what it is you're doing or if something could change yeah um, we do have a we do have a, you know I love the rock solidness of of North Dakotans, but it's really frustrating when it seems to be the reason why we shouldn't change something, even if it's for the, the benefit of people. So we have to be persistent. And so in order to do that, um, when people are questioning what you're doing is to make sure you have, have other people around you. I think that's what why organizations start up is so people can be around like-minded people, right. have each other's back. Um, I, I love the analogy of somebody saying it's like singing in the choir when you're having a sustained note and we are we are taught to do intermittent breathing knowing that if the whole choir is holding a note we can each take our breaths at different times so it's a kind of the idea of being a part of a large enough group where if you need to step back because you're tired and worn out you can because other people are sustaining a note for you I love um, that. And it brings it back to your music. I yeah, love it. there you go. <laughs> Maybe that's why it resonates. Yeah, yeah. It, it resonates, but um bump. <laughs> and, and with that, like um, sometimes just that music analogy, when I was kind of talking with, you know, because we're going through a big change right now, all of our, our small communities, and, and as a, you know, small town person, you know, it's it's very scary where where um, a new idea or a new person, uh, it, we it, it can threaten the town and that's where that comes. It's kind of like our greatest strength is our greatest weakness, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, it's scary for everybody. But going to that that new um, that music, I was visiting with somebody that was just uh, you know they were kind of angry and I think because they were frightened and um, they went through all these series of kind of kind of ideas or grievances until finally we found one that we agreed on and then it was all okay. And then they're like, okay, I can support you. And somebody gave me this analogy. It's like, it's kind of like when a singer is singing and they're trying to go, they go through their whole range of uh, vocals as they're, and then they find the right notes. And that's what they're trying to do. And I think that's maybe something like to add music to our, as we're interacting with people is like, just, interact and find that right note and hold that note as long as you can together until somebody else can hold it for you. Maybe, I don't know, but I love that you brought music in and, <laughs> and I, I really like that um, because you're so deeply North Dakotan, you understand our culture so well and how we uh, interact that. I, I'm talking more than you, but so. I, <laughs> no, no, that's good. Good. <laughs> I, I just think it's so interesting because um, you know, because uh, it's North Dakota and we're just so complex but also so hardy uh, and so so that's a lot of the immigration uh, um, yeah. has that been like your main kind of 
drive in, in your life or is it all human rights or, or is that just particularly here? It's, it's actually all human rights. And I, I, and I always say that that was my entree into the, the world of human rights. Um, as I started, um, we got involved with a group that was trying to establish a Department of Human Rights at the state level. And then I was starting to meet people from the um, LGBTQ plus community um, who were also looking for um, protections that weren't existing in our state. Um, I was um, meeting people with uh, the world of, of um, disabilities that were, were saying that there, there's lots of things right. that, that's, that's missing. Um, certainly got into connection with uh, our, the indigenous peoples of our state the First Peoples um, and yeah. recognizing the issues that they continue to, to raise throughout time. So it rec recognized the pan human rights aspect of what's happening um, in our state. And, um, and so actually we, we, um, we, we had a success because currently in our state, we have the Department of Labor and Human Rights. So there was a change that, and again, it took a long, <laughs> yes. It was session after session going in to promote this idea. And first we needed to, I always, I remember this one committee, we had to go in and convince these, uh, a, a group of, I was going to say old white men, they were older white men who were saying, well, there's no problem. Why do we need to address a problem that doesn't exist? And it's like, do you realize the irony of your statement? Of course, as an, you know, and I, as, an, as a white man would never have understood there was a problem unless I saw it through other people's experiences right. because I was not. Right. So the one that we really have ended up being the most active on is adding, you know, we, everyone said we have a really great human rights law in North Dakota. Um, it offers great protections for seven protected classes of citizens. And it does it in, in, a, in a really expansive way, covering all aspects of life where people could be discriminated against. But it does not, and to this day, does not include members of the LGBTQ plus community, nor does it protect people in terms of gender identity. And so we have been working hard um, for the last 10 sessions, bringing a bill saying, add this group of people because they are being discriminated against in housing and employment, um, offer them the, that protection. And um, I think it's slowly chipping away. It's, it's an interesting thing in the sense that the, the surveys that are being taken shows that a vast majority of people believe that protections should be there. Mm -hmm. They just only elect people to the legislature who carry that same belief. So um it's been an uphill battle but this is an this is another you know when you contrast it to immigrants and refugees who are first generation in our state this issue hits at the core of who we all are because we have gay sons and daughters mothers yeah. and fathers aunts and uncles north dakota and born yep. um who point. are affected by this and many of whom have felt they needed to leave the state in order to be who they are. Right. And so it's, it's, a, it's a really a core value system that I think is something that um, is, is frustrating that in 2020, we are having the conversations we need to have. Yeah, but keep fighting, keep fighting. And because we'll win that battle, we'll win that war, but there, there's all these battles and I'm just, you're a great translator from the old white man <laughs> to our new generation that's going to be more welcoming and uh, sustainable. Exactly. You're yeah. our translator so, right now. <laughs> so that's my advice to the young people coming up is that saying uh, we, you are so needed. Yeah. So please consider, um, don't just, just get your education here and then leave. You, you are so needed in our state. If we are going to um, bend this moral uh, arc, arc of the moral universe. We we need we need young people doing that. Um, yeah. And I'm amazed by their their intuition and their passion for justice. I I really I'm really encouraged. Yeah, yeah. 
and run for pu public office. <laughs> and I, you know, it's interesting. I, I at times I was actually challenged this by by a young person who said, "No, and you know what? Challenge us to respect the the experience and wisdom of people who've gone before us. You know, we may have different ways of doing this, but we don't. We should not. And 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 please don't withhold." The experience that you've had because we can build off of what's come right. before us so right a lot of wisdom there a lot yeah. of wisdom okay barry uh that's well you know thank you for that and thank you for like uh fighting so hard for all north dakotans and all people just all people especially in north dakota so this is my this is the last question um that I always like to ask. I mean, clearly you've been dedicated to North Dakota. Uh, and uh, so what's your favorite thing about North Dakota? You know, I, I am, I am, you know, what first comes to mind and they, and this would maybe surprise people as a rule. I am a, I'm a child of the prairie. I, mm -hmm. I love the large open skies, the most incredibly beautiful clouds, the, the, um, the vision that you can see for miles and miles and miles. Um, I, I love the flatness. I mean, that, that people roll their eyes at me at times, but I, and, and at the same time, I grew up in the Cheyenne River Valley. So there's this, you know, there, these, this sameness of the prairie gets interrupted by these beautiful oases of river valleys. So I love the scenery of North Dakota from go. east to west. And I, I love the west as much as well. Yeah. And I do, I do value the, the people here. I really truly believe there is salt of the earth people that, that live here, um, that choose to make and they, they honestly do they have we have to choose to be here because it's yes you know we could say oh the weather or or you know the emptiness or whatever there's lots of reasons to say we should leave and yeah. and we choose not to so there's something yeah. really solid about that yeah i i agree and there's something unifying about that because we've all chosen to stay here yeah. <laughs> we we have and i love that you like the scenery because that is what i always say about the prairie is that the sky and the land have equal equal play in your in your vision and that's what you're all about is equality and and fairness and balance and so thank you for that thank you thank you thank you thank you for this conversation wow yeah. what a what a what a value added to my afternoon and week <laughs> we all ought to have them <laughs> yeah. yes. okay thanks guys <laughs>